When we last left Lucullus, he just finished orchestrating one of the greatest Roman victories ever. Certainly in the century that he lived in, it was one of the greatest ones. In terms of the numerical odds that he faced, it was a smashing victory, maybe five to one against him. This was the victory that he won against King Tigranes of Armenia at the Battle of Tigranocerta or Tigranokert. But where was Mithridates on that day, King Mithridates of Pontus, the man about whom this war was all ostensibly about? Well, here's what Plutarch says of the aftermath of the Battle of Tigranokert. Quote, Mithridates made no haste to be at the battle. He thought Lucullus would carry on the war with his accustomed caution and indirectness, and so he marched slowly to join Tigranes. At first, he met a few Armenians hurrying back over the road in panic fear and conjectured what had happened. Then presently, when he had learned of the defeat from more unarmed and wounded fugitives whom he met, he sought to find Tigranes. And though he found him destitute of all things and humiliated, he did not return his insolent behavior. Tigranes had kind of disrespected him earlier. But he got down from his horse, Mithridates did, and he wept with Tigranes over their common sufferings. Then he gave him his own royal equipage, his servants, etc., and tried to fill him with courage for the future. And so these kings began to assemble fresh forces. I'm Alex Petkus. You are listening to The Cost of Glory. This is part three of three of highlights from the life of Lucullus. We're following Plutarch's biography of the man. In this episode, about this towering figure, yes, Lucullus was also tall, like Julius Caesar, we'll get to see not just the conqueror, but more of what Lucullus was like in private life, and also a hint of how he fit into the larger story of the fall of the Republic and the rise of Julius Caesar. Before we get there, though, a quick word from our sponsors. Here's something special about Lucullus. I've talked before how many Romans of the late Republic used learning a classical language to magnify their power as persuaders and orators. Cicero wrote about how important it was for him to learn Greek in order to perfect his Roman oratory skills, his Latin skills, that is. Lucullus did this too, as we'll see. Learning another ancient language with an amazing literary tradition was important for Lucullus, for Cicero, and for countless other Romans, both as a training for thinking better and as a tool for being able to write better with more flexibility and power and persuasiveness. Great English writers have done this too with both Greek and Latin. And what Cicero and Lucullus both did was hire private tutors to make sure they made the quickest progress possible. And actually, they had the same tutor, Antiochus of Ascalon, for Greek philosophy, which I think is fascinating. So everyone on the internet that I talk to now seems to know that a private tutor is by far the best way to learn. Well, our sponsor and fellow Cost of Glory fanboys, the guys at the Ancient Language Institute, offer private tutoring in Greek and Latin. Their tutors generally follow their own unique, very well-thought-out curriculum, but they also tailor it to your specific needs, and you can start any time. They offer Greek, Latin, Old English, and Hebrew. Old English and Hebrew, I'm told, are currently full, but Greek and Latin are available and better anyway, if you ask the host of The Cost of Glory his opinion. AncientLanguage.com is the main website. Specific links in the show notes. Tell them I sent you if you go there. Thanks, Ancient Language Institute for your commitment to Roman greatness and for being fans of the cost of glory. So before going on to the next stages of this war, the aftermath of this great battle of Tigrana Kurt, I just want to repeat what Plutarch says about what was so special about Lucullus's victory at Tigrana Kurt. He says, He used up Mithridates at the height of his power by long delays but crushed Tigranes by the speed of his operations, being one of the few generals of all time to use delay for greater achievement and boldness for greater safety. So it was a pretty extraordinary victory. So after he wins uh, Tigranokert, you might recall that Tigranes had built the city of Tigranokerta on basically importing large populations of people from all over his empire, and Lucullus 
Long story short, he sieges the city and it quickly capitulates. There are a lot of Greeks in the city that are, you know, much inclined to cede to the Romans and not be subjects of this Armenian despot. And so they make it easy for him and he, he captures the city and he, he actually repatriates a lot of the people and he, he essentially undoes the work that Tigranes had done by founding this great royal capital with all these people from across the empire. Lucullus just sends them back home. And uh, this is, he's seen as a great liberator, but it stops going well for Lucullus not too long after this. And we'll get there. Uh, there is some more of the war left that I want to cover for you first. Um, I'm going to skip over most of the details. The war actually does continue for a couple of years. And we'll be kind of summarizing here. So after Lucullus wins the Battle of Tigranokerta, totally against expectations of all the leaders in the region, he starts getting all of these embassies from various local kings and dynasts. And one of them is the Parthian king, the king of the empire that eventually would ruin Crassus. These are a kind of Persianate people that rule this empire that stretches from Mesopotamia, from, from Iraq, all the way to Afghanistan. It's, it's a huge empire, and he's just kind of brushing against the western edges of it now. And the Parthians offer an alliance with him, but he soon figures out that they're, they're playing both sides, they're double dealing, and so he decides to try to mount a campaign against the Parthians to punish them for supporting Tigranes, for supporting the you know, his enemy. And he's about to march against them, but his troops are unwilling. Bad sign. And we'll see more of the motivation for his troops' mutinous behavior later on. But so he, he scuttles the Parthian campaign idea. And he was this close to doing it, apparently. But he, he doesn't do that. And he decides, long story short, the, he'll try to continue the war here in Armenia and provoke Tigranes into an engagement. He's got a similar problem with Tigranes that he's been having with Mithridates. The kings have refused to surrender. They don't, even though they've been defeated in battle, they, they won't be captured and they won't come to terms. So he can't really end the war. And so he wants to provoke Tigranes into engagement, maybe capture him, maybe probably more likely to get him to surrender, to give up finally, make some kind of settlement. And he'll, his goal in that case will be to make Tigranes, say, a Roman client king, an ally. And so here's how he decides to try to do it. He marches on the old royal capital of the Armenian Empire that's been there since, well, about more than 100 years at this point, Artaxata, which is in Armenia proper today. It's actually just inside the border of Armenia, across the border from Turkey. It's at the foot of Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat, this great symbolic mountain in this area, is actually in Turkey, which was historic Armenia in, that, in those times. But so that's where Artaxata is, kind of deeper into the traditional territories of Armenia. Tigranokir was sort of on the southern border of of. Tigranes' kingdom. All right, so he goes to Artaxata. Here's what Plutarch says. He therefore broke camp and marched against Artaxata, the royal residence of Tigranes, where his wives and young children were, thinking that Tigranes would not give these up without fighting. And listen to this. This is the origin story of the city of Artaxata. Quote, it is said that Hannibal the Carthaginian, this is still Plutarch, Hannibal the Carthaginian, after Antiochus had been conquered by the Romans, left him and went to Artaxas the Armenian. So back note here, Hannibal was defeated in the Second Carthaginian, the Second Punic War, excuse me, in, um, by Rome. And he goes east and he's harbored by these eastern kings, Antiochus first, and then Antiochus gets defeated by the Romans. And so he goes even further east to the Armenians. So he goes to Artaxas the Armenian, continuing on, to whom he gave many excellent suggestions and instructions. For instance, observing that a section of the country, which had the greatest natural advantages and attractions, was lying idle and neglected. He drew up a plan for a city there and brought Artaxas to the place and showed him its possibilities and urged him to undertake the building. 
The king was delighted and begged Hannibal to superintend the work himself. Whereupon a very great and beautiful city arose there, which was named after the king and proclaimed the capital of Armenia. And Lucullus is going to try to make more of that in a second. But that's a fascinating backstory here. So uh, long story short, he, he fights another battle against Tigranes. And Mithridates is there too. He defeats them both. Lucullus, that is. And Lucullus, again, is substantially outnumbered. And we don't have all that many details on the battle from any source. Uh, but even here, I think, you know, Hearing about too many battles at once, you know, they could start to kind of run together. So I'm going to skip the description that Plutarch has. But you know, suffice to say, it was, a, it was a lopsided victory. According to Livy, th- this victory was one in which fewer of the enemy fell than at Tigranokert. But the enemies that did fall or were captured were, were men of much higher status on average. So, you know, Lucullus kills or captured many of the cream of the Armenian nobility and their allies – uh, so it's a great victory, but unfortunately, Mithridates and Tigranes, they escape once again. And so Lucullus wants to chase them, but here's what happens. And as you're reading this, remember, have some pity in your heart, I guess, but these Roman soldiers have been fighting here for maybe six years constantly in this region since they left Rome, since they've left Italy. So that's... the. That gives you a little bit of background here. So, elated and emboldened by this victory, says Plutarch, Lucullus purposed to advance further into the interior and subdue the barbarian realm utterly. But contrary to what might have been expected at the time of the autumnal equinox, severe winter weather was encountered, which generally covered the ground with snow and even when the sky was clear produced hoar frost and ice, owing to which the horses could not well drink of the rivers So excessive was the cold, nor could they easily cross them, since the ice broke and cut the horse's sinews with its jagged edges. Most of the country was thickly shaded, full of narrow defiles and marshy, so that it kept the soldiers continually wet. They were covered with snow while they marched and spent the nights uncomfortably in damp places. Accordingly, they had not followed Lucullus for many days after the battle, when they began to object. At first they sent their tribunes to him, These are the military tribunes, completely distinct from the political tribunes of the plebs, basically superior officers. They sent the tribunes to him with entreaties to desist. Then they held more tumultuous assemblies and shouted in their tents at night, which seems to have been characteristic of a mutinous army. And yet Lucullus plied them with entreaties. He's begging them, calling upon them to possess their souls in patience you know, have some self-control, until they had taken and destroyed the Armenian Carthage, the work of their most hated foe, meaning Hannibal. So they haven't actually captured the city. They haven't neutralized Tigranes or, 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 or captured the city. They're campaigning in the region. But since he could not persuade them, he led them back, and crossing the Taurus by another pass, descended into the country called Migdonia, which is a fertile region and open to the sun and contains a large and populous city called Nisibis by the barbarians, Antioch and Mygdonia by the Greeks. So he tries to get them to take what he calls Armenian Carthage. He's talking about Artaxata there, which is a little bit of a stretch, right? I mean, it's not exactly looming across the pond from Rome, uh, but they they refuse. And so instead of taking them further campaigning in Armenia, it's sort of strange. He, he takes them on this very circuitous route back in scare quotes, but he actually marches 200 miles south to Nisibis and 200 miles through mountainous territory. That's like about the entire length of the Colorado section of the Rocky Mountains or the combined length of the Alps in both Switzerland and Austria. So it's a long way that he's taking them south, not directly back to Pontus. Uh, and, and this already, already when he gets to Artaxata and still when he's in Nisibis, he's, he's by far further east than any Roman commander has ever gone in the east at the head of an army. 
Anisibis is actually even quite further east than Crassus ever got at Cari. Uh, but so Lucullus comes to Nisibis, which is New Sibene in Turkey. It's near Mardin. It's on the Syrian border. And he comes to Nisibis from the northeast, actually. And it was an important Seleucid Empire capital. There are a lot of Greeks there. I'll skip the details. But in long story short, he captures Nisibis in a siege. And that's a victory. So, you know, put that notch on your belt. But here's really where it starts to turn sour for Lucullus. You know, the mutiny that you saw earlier, the troops dragging their feet, it's not necessarily a disaster. I mean, even Alexander the Great faced mutiny. And you see mutiny in the Anabasis of Xenophon, discontent among the troops. Uh, But in retrospect, you know, you can start to see this was maybe part of a pattern. And and so Nisibis is the furthest he gets on his campaigns. And Plutarch has some interesting reflections on Lucullus's character here that I'll read for you. Quote, Up to this point, one might say that fortune had followed Lucullus and fought on his side, but from now on, as though a favoring breeze had failed him, he had to force every issue and met with obstacles everywhere. He still displayed the bravery and patience of a good leader, but his undertakings brought him no new fame or favor. Indeed, so ill-starred and diverted was his course that he came near losing that which he had already won. And he himself was not least to blame for this. He was not disposed to court the favor of the common soldier and thought that everything that was done to please one's command, that is, the people under one's command, everything that was done to please one's command only dishonored and undermined one's own authority Worst of all, not even with men of power and of equal rank with himself could he easily cooperate. He despised them all and thought them of no account as compared with himself. These bad qualities Lucullus is said to have had, but no more than these. He was tall and handsome, a powerful speaker, and equally able in the forum and in the field. So not only is Lucullus competent, he's also basically a good man. And that's a very rare combination in any era. And probably, I'd say, in the late Republic of Rome, it's extremely rare. I mean, in a great system like the Roman Republic in these late days, there was a lot of room for corruption. And there were a lot of very unscrupulous, ambitious people who claw their way to the top in a system like that when the stakes are so high and the the checks and balances on corruption or kind of minimal. And so Lucullus thought he was better than those kind of people. We've already met some. Maybe Clodius you'd put in that category. Cathegus, Gabinius, some of the cronies of Pompey, like that. But uh, Plutarch gives some examples of what he means by, you know, pointing to Lucullus's failure to flatter and this is something that I think he, he did not, a lesson he did not pick up from Sulla, that Sulla was actually really good at what Lucullus was not good at here. Well, here's what Plutarch says. Well, then Sallust says that his soldiers were ill-disposed towards him at the very beginning of the war. This would have been, by the way, from Sallust's lost work of the histories that uh, was from 78 BC till about this time. That was the period that it covered. So anyway, Sallust says, it's a fragment of Sallust, basically. Sallust says, that the soldiers were ill-disposed towards him at the very beginning of the war, before Sisychus, and again before Amasos, when they were in a camp in front of these cities, they were compelled to spend two successive winters in camp. The winters that followed also vexed them. They spent them either in the enemy's country or among the allies, and camped under the open sky. Not once did Lucullus take his army into a city that was Greek and friendly. So what he's saying here is Lucullus, basically because he was trying to spare his allies the expense and the trouble of billeting soldiers, or in other words, quartering them in civilian homes, 
you know, this is a very unpopular practice for for allies, right? For for people that you've conquered. You know, this is a contributor to the American Revolutionary War breakout. You know, the British soldiers quartered in civilian houses. It's an easy way to expend any goodwill you have with the local population. So Lucullus doesn't do that to kind of court the favor of your soldiers. Sulla did that. He was famous for doing that. So Lucullus doesn't. And uh, it's Plutarch's going to explain also what's going on on the home front for Lucullus here. And he doesn't explain it this way explicitly in this passage, but this has a lot to do with Pompey. Okay. In their disaffection, the soldiers received the greatest support from the popular leaders at Rome. These envied Lucullus and denounced him for protracting the war through love of power and love of wealth. They said he all but had in his own sole power Cilicia, Asia, Bithynia, Paphlagonia, Galatia, Pontus, Armenia, and the regions extending to the Phasis River, and that now he had actually plundered the palaces of Tigranes as if he had been sent not to subdue the kings but to strip them. These were the words, they say, of Lucius Quintus, one of the praetors. He means Quinctius here, Lucius Quinctius, who was actually an old enemy of Lucullus, to whom most of all the people listened to this Lucius Quinctius guy when they passed a vote to send men who should succeed Lucullus in the command of the province. So Lucullus' enemies are starting to undermine his command back home legally. And what adds insult to injury is some of the undermining is happening from people who should be Lucullus' allies. And this is really painful. Imagine what this must have been like if this was happening to you. We're getting back to our old friend Clodius, a guy that we met in the life of Crassus and we'll see again in the life of Pompey. Man, we have not heard the last of this guy. Okay, so here's Plutarch on Clodius. To these factors in the case, so unfavorable in themselves, there was added another, which most of all vitiated the undertakings of Lucullus. This was Publius Clodius, a man of wanton violence and full of all arrogance and boldness. He was a brother of the wife of Lucullus, a woman of the most dissolute ways, Clodia, that is, whom he was actually accused of debauching. So Clodius was actually accused of, uh, you know, debauching his own sister, Lucullus's wife. Wow. You remember Lucullus's mother? She was... Supposed to have been a sort of a dissolute woman, a Metella. I mean, they say that daughters tend to marry a man like their father and sons tend to marry a woman like their mother. So you wonder there. Well, going on. At this time, Clodius was in service with Lucullus, and he did not get all the honor which he thought was his due. He thought a foremost place his due, and when many were preferred before him because of his evil character, he worked secretly upon the soldiers who had been commanded by Fimbria and tried to incite them against Lucullus, disseminating among them speeches well adapted to men who were neither unwilling nor unaccustomed to have their favor courted. Man, the betrayal, right? These were the men whom Fimbria had once persuaded to kill the consul Flaccus and choose himself for their general they therefore gladly listened to Clodius also, and called him the soldier's friend. For he pretended to be incensed on their behalf, that there was to be no end of their countless wars and toils, but they were rather to wear out their lives in fighting with every nation and wandering over every land, receiving no suitable reward for such service, but conveying the wagons and camels of Lucullus, laden with golden beakers set with precious stones, while the soldiers of Pompey, citizens now, were snugly ensconced with wives and children in the possession of fertile lands and prosperous cities. So he's talking about Pompey's soldiers from the Sertorian Wars and from the civil wars before that. They're citizens now. You know, they were not citizens and they were made Roman citizens. And so probably a lot of Lucullus's soldiers are in that spot. Italians maybe or allies who were hoping for citizenship. It's one of their motivations for fighting. 
So Pompey's soldiers, this is going on with the kind of honeyed words that Clodius is pouring into the ears of these soldiers, not for having driven Mithridates and Tigranes into uninhabitable deserts, nor for having demolished the royal palaces of Asia, but for having fought with wretched exiles in Spain and runaway slaves in Italy. So he's telling them, they fought easy wars, guys. You you guys are fighting the hard war here and you're not getting any of the rewards. Why then, Clodius would cry, if our campaigns are never to come to an end, do we not reserve what is left of our bodies and our lives for a general in whose eyes the wealth of his soldiers is his fairest honor? So you see there Clodius already kind of courting Pompey in front of those soldiers. For such reasons as these, the army of Lucullus was demoralized and refused to follow him either against Tigranes or against Mithridates, who had come back into Pontus from Armenia and was trying to restore his power there. So all of this stuff coming from his own brother-in-law. And, you know, Lucullus was not happy in his marriage with Clodia, probably. But, you know, one of the points of these dynastic marriages with a great family like the Claudii is at least you get some political alliance out of it to compensate for the misery if necessary. But he doesn't even get that either. He just uh, he just gets backstabbed by the people that are supposed to be on his side. So, uh, you know, you wonder if Lucullus kind of had this dynamic that you see with successful men sometimes who really throw themselves into their work precisely because their home life is so unhappy. I mean, for whatever reason, you know, Lucullus and Clodia didn't get along and he didn't get along with his wife's family either. And, and maybe the, the campaign was kind of Lucullus's happy place, like work is for so many high achievers. But having that kind of a dynamic really comes at a cost. And we'll get to that later. But so at this point, as we heard at the end of that passage I quoted for you, Plutarch kind of telescopes uh, a whole lot of campaigning, but basically Lucullus faces a massive crisis. He's so overcommitted to the east. I mean, he's he's almost in northern Iraq at this point, in Nisibis. And I think you can kind of blame him for underestimating Mithridates at this point. Because Mithridates sees, hey, the Romans have woefully underfortified Pontus. And so Mithridates sees an opportunity and he sweeps back in to his own old kingdom with his army and he captures a couple of strongholds. And by the time Lucullus realizes this, it's a little too late. He takes his troops back to Asia Minor, but right as he's closing in, Mithridates forces a battle with the subordinate commander that Lucullus left in the area and he wins a massive victory over Rome. And that battle takes place near a city called Zela, which is in North Central Asia Minor. And this is actually the same place that 20 years later, Caesar is going to fight another battle of Zela against a rebel king in the area. And that's where Caesar later declared, Veni vidi vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. But that's kind of what Mithridates did on the Romans, unfortunately, especially on this poor Roman legate that Lucullus left in charge. Triarius is the guy's name. So it's a disaster at the Battle of Zela. Uh, you know, hundreds of centurions killed, dozens of military tribunes. It's a really bad loss, one of the worst in the East in decades. And so Mithridates is exultant in this victory, and he invites Tigranes back into the area. And then Lucullus is trying to get his army ready to try to block these two kings from reuniting their forces and completely undoing all the work that he's done. And then Lucullus' troops just flatly refuse to fight. And by this time, part of the army has been legally stripped of Lucullus by a decree of the people of Rome. That is, by his populist enemies back at Rome. They organized a plebiscite to do that for the powers of the tribune of the plebs. But, you know, if his soldiers wanted to, if they really wanted to, they could still fight for him. I mean, there aren't a whole lot of Roman commanders around, actually. If only Lucullus could convince them to fight for him. 
the sort of thing that has certainly happened before in Roman history. Think of Sulla, and it doesn't necessarily have to imply anything like civil unrest, but Lucullus can't convince them to. Here's what Plutarch says. Accordingly, there was no expedient, however much beneath his dignity, to which Lucullus did not force himself to resort. Entreating the soldiers, man by man, going about from tent to tent, in humility and tears, and actually taking some of the men by the hand in supplication. So Lucullus, really, this is very out of character for him, but he, he realizes what he has to do. But... They rejected his advances and threw their empty purses down before him, bidding him to fight the enemy alone, since he alone knew how to get rich from them. So it's a money issue, it seems. And uh, here's the worst part for Lucullus in these days when his soldiers are refusing to fight. Remember how Lucullus had Pontus officially declared a province by the Senate after he beat Mithridates out of his kingdom at proud moment. Well, now Mithridates is recapturing his kingdom and Lucullus has the, the embassy from the Senate that's there to kind of make it official and do the land surveying and all the stuff they have to do, the commissars or the commissioners. Here's what happens. He therefore simply held his soldiers together without forcing them any more or leading them out to battle as he looked on helplessly while Tigranes ravaged Cappadocia and Mithridates resumed his insolent ways. A monarch whom he had reported by letter to the Senate as completely subdued. Besides, the commissioners were now with him who had been sent out to regulate the affairs of Pontus on the supposition that it was a secure Roman possession. So they're like, show us this province, Lucullus. And lo, when they came, they saw that Lucullus was not even his own master, but was mocked and insulted by his soldiers. God, it's got to be excruciating and humiliating. And meanwhile, Pompey, you may remember that we mentioned this briefly in the life of Crassus. So what's happened is Pompey, in 67 BC, he got a very generous sweeping law passed to give him authority over the war against the pirates. And he took care of that problem in less than six months. And then in 66 BC, he gets a tribune buddy of his to kind of do it again, to propose a sweeping law the tribune buddy of his was named Manilius. It was called the Lex Manilius. So they propose a, a law transferring the command of all of the Eastern War to Pompey himself alone, and it gets passed in a plebiscite. So Pompey comes to the neighborhood to collect the car keys from Lucullus. The rest of the soldiers, this is Plutarch again, the rest of the soldiers Pompey summoned by letter for he had already been appointed to conduct the war against Mithridates and Tigranes, because he won the favor of the people and flattered their leaders. But the Senate and nobility considered Lucullus a wronged man. He had been superseded, they said, not in a war, but in a triumph. So you know, Pompey didn't take the war from him, he just took the victory from him. And it, he had been forced to relinquish and turn over to others, not his campaign, but the prizes of the victory in his campaign. So they're saying, Lucullus really did the work for this war that you're about to go in and win and claim victory for. That, that might be a little bit uh, through the benefit of hindsight of what happened. But to those who were on the spot, what happened there seemed still greater matter for wrath and indignation. This is what Pompey's doing to Lucullus as he's coming in to kind of take over the operations. For Lucullus was not allowed to bestow rewards or punishments for what, he had, what had been done in the war, nor would Pompey even allow anyone to visit Lucullus or to pay any heed to the edicts and regulations which he made in concert with the ten commissioners, but prevented it by issuing counter-edicts and by the terror which his presence with a larger force inspired. 
but they do have a moment here. Nevertheless, their friends decided to bring the two men together, and so they met in a certain village of Galatia. They greeted one another amicably, and each congratulated the other on his victories. That must have been awkward. Lucullus was the elder man, but Pompey's prestige was the greater because he had conducted more campaigns and celebrated two triumphs. Fasces wreathed with laurel were carried before both commanders in token of their victories. And since Pompey had made a long march through waterless and arid regions, the laurel which wreathed his Fasces was withered. Fasces, of course, the insignia of Roman magistrates. When the lictors who were carrying these, when the lictors of Lucullus noticed this, they considerately gave Pompey's lictors some of their own laurel, which was fresh and green. This circumstance was interpreted as a good omen by the friends of Pompey, for in fact the exploits of Lucullus did adorn the command of Pompey. However, their conference resulted in no equitable agreement, but they left it still more estranged from one another. Pompey also annulled the ordinances of Lucullus and took away all but 1,600 of his soldiers. These he left to share his triumph, but even these did not follow him very cheerfully. To such a marvelous degree was Lucullus either unqualified or unfortunate as regards the first and highest of all requisites in a leader. Had this power of gaining the affection of his soldiers been added to his other gifts, which were so many and so great, courage, diligence, wisdom, and justice, the Roman Empire would not have been bounded by the Euphrates, but by the outer confines of Asia and the Hyrcanian Sea. So he means the Caspian Sea there, and I think he means the Persian Gulf too. For all the other nations had already been subdued by Tigranes, and in the time of Lucullus the Parthian power was not so great as it proved to be in the time of Crassus, nor was it so well united. Nay, rather, owing to intestine and neighboring wars, it had not even the strength enough to repel wanton attacks of the Armenians. So, imagine, as Plutarch does, what could have happened if Lucullus had been able to keep the fervent loyalty of his soldiers, as Sulla did, as Pompey did, and, and as he failed to. So Lucullus returns to Rome, and it's unfortunately not a glorious homecoming. It's not the thing that he had been imagining when he was conquering Mithridates and Armenia and capturing Nisibis. There's a tribune there at Rome that is just determined to make Lucullus's life miserable. Here's Plutarch. Now, when Lucullus had returned to Rome, he found, in the first place, that his brother Marcus was under prosecution by Gaius Memmius, this is the tribune, for his acts as quester under the administration of Sulla. So Memmius is prosecuting Lucullus's brother Marcus for acts committed 20 years earlier, which gives you a sense that this is a politically motivated trial, of course, going on with Plutarch. Marcus indeed was acquitted, but Memmius then turned his attack upon Lucullus and strove to excite the people against him. He charged Lucullus with diverting much property to his own uses and with needlessly protracting the war and finally persuaded the people not to grant him a triumph. Lucullus strove mightily against this decision. The triumph, of course, is the victory celebration that every Roman general hopes to achieve after a great foreign conquest. Lucullus strove mightily against this decision, and the foremost and most influential men mingled with the tribes and by much entreaty and exertion at last persuaded the people to allow him to celebrate a triumph. And I'm going to pause there. So Plutarch makes it sound like this got sorted out rather quickly. But actually, Lucullus had to wait three years for his triumph. And it wasn't just waiting for your victory celebration. So when a Roman general comes back from war, he has this thing the Romans call imperium. He has consular or, pro, or you know, praetorian, whatever. It's consular 
imperium, in the case of Lucullus, he has basically military authority. And as soon as a Roman commander enters the official religious city limits of Rome, the pomerium, which is not the entire extent of the city, but it's, you know, everything important is in the pomerium. As soon as he enters that, he loses his imperium. He has to put it down. But in order to celebrate a triumph, you have to still have imperium. And what it is, is it's basically you get voted the right by the people to, for a single day, carry on your imperium in through the pomerium as general and then you kind of lay it down at the altar of Zeus at the end of your victory celebration. So so basically if Lucullus wants to celebrate a triumph and you, know, you could see a similar thing with Sulla earlier but if Lucullus wants to celebrate a triumph he has to stay outside the pomerium he has to stay outside the official religious city limits. So for 3 years he is outside the Pomerium before finally in 63 he gets you know, his friends work a favor for him. Cicero has a lot to do with this um, when Cicero is consul in 63. He finally gets his triumph voted to him. And 63 is also the year in which Mithridates finally died. He committed suicide after Pompey defeated him in the east. Meanwhile, Pompey has basically won the war that Lucullus had made so much progress in and you know, he's turned all of these territories into Roman provinces. We'll get to that in the life of Pompey. But so finally, when, when Pompey's already overshadowed him, it's, it's allowed for Lucullus to celebrate his triumph. And I think you could kind of see in these circumstances how a guy like Lucullus might get kind of bitter and at least disillusioned about the world of politics. And it's interesting, as a side note here, this guy Memmius that prosecutes his brother and then blocks Lucullus's triumph. Memmius is actually the dedicatee of the famous poem De Rerum Natura by Lucretius, this Epicurean poem that Lucretius wrote. And it's probably about 10 years later that he actually finished the poem and dedicated it to Memmius. But this is the guy that uh, that was a, he was a patron of poets. He was, you know, kind of a dandy... And um, notably a adulterer. But more on Memmius later. I think we'll do an episode on Lucretius at some point. But so Lucullus is suffering these three years. And in these three years that he's waiting for his triumph, that's probably the period that he divorces his no good wife, Clodia. And he marries another woman. Um, but before we get to that, let's give him his triumph. Here, here's what Plutarch says about his triumph. He decorated the circus of Flaminius with the arms of the enemy, which were very numerous, and with the royal engines of war. And this was a great spectacle in itself and far from contemptible. But in the procession, a few of the mail-clad horsemen, so he's got these cataphracts in their armor, he processes them through the streets of the city. Ten also of the scythe-bearing chariots moved along. Imagine seeing those go through the sacred way in Rome and roll down into the forum, together with 60 of the king's friends and generals. 110 bronze-beaked ships of war were also carried along. You'd think it would just be the beaks from the ships, but I mean, Plutarch does say that they actually carried the ships along, so maybe they hauled them up the Tiber. And I mean, it sounds incredible. Also, a golden statue of Mithridates himself, six feet in height, a life-size replica, that is, he was a tall man, a wonderful shield adorned with precious stones, 20 litters of silver vessels, and 32 litters of gold beakers, you know, like stretchers for carrying people, just filled with gold and silver and armor and money. And then there's more couches and ingot. We won't go through all of it. It was, it was a huge procession. Fabulous wealth that Lucullus brought back from the east and deposited much of it in the Roman treasury. Now, so he divorces his, his wife, Clodia, in this time that he's waiting for his triumph. And uh, I'm just going to read you the passage here. After he divorced Clodia, who was a licentious and base woman, who, nudge, nudge, might have been a little too friendly with her brother, Clodius, he married Servilia, a sister of Cato. But this, too, was an unfortunate marriage, 
for it lacked none of the evils which Clodia had brought in her train, except one, namely the scandal about her brothers. So at, at least for all you, the bad things you could say about Servilia, she didn't sleep with her own brother, but she was still bad. In all other respects, Servilia was equally vile and abandoned. And yet Lucullus forced himself to tolerate her out of regard for Cato, Cato the Younger, famously upstanding man. And, you know, Lucullus kind of did Cato a favor and just white knuckled his way through for a while. At last, however, he put her away too. So who do, who do you blame for that? Servilia or Lucullus? Lucullus's taste in women? I don't know. But, you know, I think put this together with his failure to win over his troops, failing to keep these two women faithful, Clodia first and Servilia. I mean, especially with Servilia, right? He's not off fighting a war. He doesn't have that excuse. Why can't they make it work out? Well, you start to think maybe there's a pattern here. Lucullus, let's admit it, he really lacks charm when it counts. Like, it takes one skill set to be a great commander, and it's an amazing skill set, and he's got it. Takes one skill set, you might say, to be a great governor of Florida. But you know, to be the first man in the Republic, well, that's a different kind of task altogether. And to do that, or even just to reach your full potential, whatever you do, you might need to do what Plato exhorted his student and his later successor, Xenocrates, to do. Xenocrates was famously unfun, and Plato used to say, I like to imagine maybe whenever Xenocrates was being a stick in the mud or being rude, well, Plato would say, hey, Xenocrates, go sacrifice to the graces. Well, maybe Lucullus needed to sacrifice to the graces just a little bit more. But he was who he was. Now, after his triumph, the year is 63 BC, Lucullus is about 55 years old at this point. And he stays sort of active in politics for a couple more years, and then he more or less calls it quits. And Plutarch doesn't really give a detailed political analysis of Lucullus' activities during this time, but essentially Lucullus ranged himself with the conservatives, with the optimates, people like the Metelli, like Hortensius, and you know Cicero was in that bunch too sometimes. And uh, Lucullus was blocking the actions of Pompey and then later Caesar, these great men who were willing to use populist measures to counterbalance the power of the aristocracy. Lucullus was definitely a member of that aristocracy. But, you know, you get the sense that his heart really isn't in it anymore in the political game. After seven years away from Italy, off campaigning in the East, and another three years semi-isolated from politics. He's you know, busy building his new mansions with the money he's gotten from the East, and he's staying outside of the official limits, outside of the pomerium. And you know, even before then, in the 80s, he's spending almost an entire decade off in the East as a quester, avoiding the civil wars. You know, by this point in his life, Lucullus is just not a creature of the Forum and the Senate House anymore, if he ever was. And he got judged for kind of leaving it behind. Here's Plutarch. The Senate had conceived wondrous hopes that in Lucullus it would find an opposer of the tyranny of Pompey and a champion of the aristocracy with all the advantage of great glory and influence. But he quitted and abandoned public affairs, either because he saw that they were already beyond proper control and diseased or, as some say, because he had had his fill of glory and felt that the unfortunate issue of his many struggles and toils entitled him to fall back upon a life of ease and luxury. Some commend him for making such a change and thereby escaping the unhappy lot of Gaius Marius, who, after his Cimbrian victories and the large and fair successes which were so famous, was unwilling to relax his efforts and enjoy the honors won, but with an insatiate desire for glory and power, old man that he was, fought with young men in the conduct of the state, and so drove headlong into terrible deeds and sufferings more terrible still. 
Cicero, say these people, would have had a better old age if he had taken in sail after the affair of Catiline. And Scipio, too, if he had given himself pause after adding Numantia to Carthage. For a political cycle, too, has a sort of natural termination, and political, no less than athletic contests, are absurd after the full vigor of life has departed. So some would say. Crassus and Pompey, on the other hand, ridiculed Lucullus for giving himself up to pleasure and extravagance, as if a luxurious life were not even more unsuitable to men of his years than political and military activities. Lucullus didn't retire right away. He was a key figure in opposing the block ratification of Pompey's political arrangements in the East after Pompey returned in the late 60s. And this was a major issue in pushing Pompey into the hands of Caesar toward that triumvirate alliance with Caesar and Crassus. Now, Lucullus was also there in 59 BC, accompanying Cato and Caesar's co-consul Bibulus on that day in the forum when the consul Bibulus got a bucket of chamber pot water dumped on his head. And, you know, seeing the way the Republic was going, you can kind of sympathize with Lucullus for wanting to kind of back away from it all after that. And, you know, maybe in his eyes, invest in something that was a little bit more lasting. I don't know. Here, here's Plutarch again. And it is true that in the life of Lucullus, as in an ancient comedy, one reads in the first part of political measures and military commands, and in the latter part of drinking bouts and banquets, and what might pass for revel routs and torch races and all manner of frivolity. Plutarch means here when he says ancient comedy, he means the ancient satyr plays, the kind of, so after Greek tragedies, there would be three tragedies on one subject and then they would have a kind of slapstick vaudeville play at the end to kind of lighten the mood, the satyr plays. So Lucullus' life was kind of like that. A lot of seriousness, and then it got silly at the end, according to Plutarch. Now, for I must count as frivolity all his costly edifices, Plutarch continues, his ambulatories and baths, and still more his paintings and statues, not to speak of his devotion to these arts which he collected at enormous outlays, pouring out into such channels the vast and splendid wealth which he accumulated from his campaigns. Even now, when luxury has increased so much, Plutarch's writing, you know, 100 years later, 150 years later or so, and he's, he's looking at Rome in the era of the, the emperors. Even now, when luxury has increased so much, the gardens of Lucullus are counted among the most costly of the imperial gardens, so, you know, Augustus, or some, one of the emperors confiscated it or bought it. As for his works on the seashore, Lucullus was famous for these, and in the vicinity of Neapolis, of, of Naples, that is, where he had suspended hills over vast tunnels, girdled his residences with zones of sea and with streams for the breeding of fish and built dwellings on the sea. I mean, this is fabulous landscape architecture bringing saltwater ponds and channels of fresh water under mountains. When Tubero the Stoic saw them, he called Lucullus Xerxes in a toga. Lucullus also had country establishments near Tusculum with observatories and extensive open banqueting halls and cloisters. And Lucullus would host the great and the good at these places for great parties. And uh, Plutarch also refers here to some lines from a Roman poet, Horace, uh, a passage I won't read from Plutarch, but I'll read you the actual Horace lines here in translation. This is a story about Lucullus, and here's the quote in translation. They say Lucullus was asked if he could lend the theater a hundred Greek cloaks. Who could find all those, he answered, but I'll see and send what I've got. Later a note. It seems at home I've 5,000. Take any of them. Take the lot. End quote. And Plutarch says that they were purple cloaks, like, you know, extremely expensive cloaks because purple was the most expensive color to dye with. You had to kill a, just a hecatomb of little murex muscles to get a single cloak. 
Uh, so that's Horace Epistles 1-6 if you want to look it up. And uh, Cicero pokes fun at Lucullus. You know, he got he got made fun of here and there. Um, you know, whenever he wants to refer to Lucullus in his letters, Lucullus and also Hortensius, he, he calls them our fish cultivators, Piscinarii, because they were, they were very enthusiastic fish hobbyists, fish breeders. But Hortensius was probably worse about this. Um, he was very precious about his fish. But, you know, this is... This is a hobby among a lot of Romans. I mean, the elder Crassus had a vice for this. But all this talk about Lucullus, though, being the luxurious Sybarite, it probably originates in anti-Lucullus propaganda worked up by people like Pompey and Clodius and Gabinius. And, you know, they're trying to get him stripped of his command in Asia. So they paint this picture of him as the, the luxurious gourmand just hoarding this wealth and not sharing it with the soldiers. But if it started there, the story stuck. And I think that Lucullus, once he got back and he was kind of disgusted with the way that politics were going in Rome and the way that the Roman state or the people had, you know, failed to honor him for his years and years of service and toils and just, you know, he decided, I guess, to own this identity, to lean into this persona of the fun, frivolous party guy. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily the, the full story, but here's some more famous stories from Plutarch that uh, have stuck through the centuries on the Lucullus as party guy line. Moreover, that Lucullus took not only pleasure, but pride in this way of living is clear from the anecdotes recorded of him. It is said, for instance, that he entertained for many successive days some Greeks who had come up to Rome, and that they, with genuinely Greek scruples, were at last ashamed to accept his invitation, on the ground that he was incurring so much expense every day on their account. Whereupon Lucullus said to them with a smile, Some of this expense, my Grecian friends, is indeed on your account. Most of it, however, is on account of Lucullus. So. I'd be doing this anyway, he said. <laughs> you might as well enjoy it. And going on another story. And once when he was dining alone and a modest repast of one course had been prepared for him, he was angry and summoned the servant who had had the matter in charge. The servant said that he did not suppose, since there were no guests, that Lucullus wanted anything very costly. And Lucullus says, What sayest thou? Dost thou not know that today Lucullus dines with Lucullus? So, you know, where does that story come from? I mean, probably Lucullus joking with some friends a day or two later spreads that story around himself. While this matter was much talked of in the city, as was natural, Cicero and Pompey came up to him as he was idling in the forum. So they were used to doing this. And, you know, surprisingly, Pompey was uh, they weren't totally alienated despite everything, which I think is one of these fascinating facets of late Republican life, the, the bitter enmities, but then people kind of get along because we're all professionals here. So Cicero was one of Lucullus's most intimate friends, going on with Plutarch here, and although the matter of the command of the army had led to some coolness between Lucullus and Pompey, still they were accustomed to frequent and friendly intercourse and conversation with one another. Accordingly, Cicero saluted Lucullus and asked how he was disposed toward receiving a petition. Most excellently well, said Lucullus, and invited them to make their petition. We desire, said Cicero, to dine with you today, just as though you would have dined by yourself. And uh, Lucullus demurred to this, but begged the privilege of selecting a later day. You know, he wants to give them a proper Lucullus feast. Ah, but they refuse to allow it. No, no, says Cicero, no, nor will we suffer you to confer with your servants that you might not order anything more provided than what was provided for yourself. Thus much, however, and no more did they allow him at his request, namely to tell one of his servants in their presence that he would dine that day in the Apollo. So Lucullus... Gets, gets them to let him to just tell that 
one little message to his servants. We're going to dine in the Apollo. Now, Plutarch continues, this Apollo was the name of one of his costly apartments, and he thus outwitted the men without their knowing it. For each of his dining rooms, it seems, had a fixed allowance for the dinner served there, as well as his own special apparatus and equipment, so that his slaves, on hearing just where he wished to dine, knew exactly how much the dinner was to cost and what were to be its decorations and arrangements. Now the usual cost of a dinner in the Apollo was 50,000 drachmas, and that was the sum laid out on the present occasion. An enormous, an enormous amount of money. Pompey was amazed at the speed with which the banquet was prepared, notwithstanding it had cost so much. So Lucullus has his meals and his, the management of his house down to a kind of military discipline of luxury where all you need is just, you know, three words. We dine at the Apollo to, to, to signal, you know, everything that involves a luxurious, sumptuous feast, all the silver and the stuffed peacock and the whatever, you know. Go read Juvenal or Petronius for Roman luxury at feasts. But, you know, you get the sense from men like Cicero writing about Lucullus later that Lucullus's passion wasn't actually partying and luxury and feasting and that all that stuff that he did was maybe even a semi-respectable cover to be presented to the eyes of Roman polite society that concealed something that was more important to him, but harder for your average Roman patriot to kind of process. And that was Lucullus's interest in Greek culture and in intellectual life. And here's Plutarch. But what he did in the establishment of a library deserves warm praise. He got together many books and they were well written, and his use of them was more honorable to him than his acquisition of them. His libraries were thrown open to all, and the cloisters surrounding them, and the study rooms were accessible without restriction to the Greeks, who constantly repaired thither as to a hostelry of the muses, and spent the day with one another in glad escape from their other occupations. Lucullus himself also often spent his leisure hours there with them, walking about in the cloisters with their scholars and he would assist their statesmen in whatever they desired. And in general, his house was a home and a Britannium for the Greeks who came to Rome. He was fond of all philosophy and well-disposed and friendly towards every school, but from the first he cherished a particular and zealous love for the academy. Not the new academy, so-called. We're getting into kind of details of the Platonic school at the time. It's just a sentence or two. Not the new academy so-called, although that school at the time had a vigorous representative of the doctrines of Carneades in Philo, but the old academy, which at that time was headed by a persuasive man and a powerful speaker in the person of Antiochus of Ascalon. So, so the old academy is what were called the dogmatists at the time. We'll get into this on, on another occasion, but this is actually more akin to the school of Platonic philosophy that Plutarch himself favored. So he was an old academy guy. So Antiochus of Ascalon, we've met before. This man, Lucullus, hastened to make his friend and companion and arrayed him against the disciples of Philo, of whom Cicero was also one. So Cicero is from the new academy persuasion, the skeptics, as they're called. Indeed, Cicero wrote a noble treatise on the doctrines of this sect in which he has put the argument in support of apprehension into the mouth of Lucullus and carried the opposing argument himself. The book is entitled Lucullus, and that is the Academica Priora, and it's the, the, the second book of that work, Academica, which is dedicated to Lucullus. Look it up. He's a prominent speaker in that treatise. Of course, it's Cicero's words, and he's purporting to re recall a conversation that he had with Lucullus, but, you know, it's imaginary. 
Another person, though, that Lucullus kept in his entourage in Asia that we didn't mention before is the Greek poet Archias, who Cicero defended in a famous speech, the Pro Archia. It's a short speech, and it's very much worth reading. There's a famous defense of the liberal arts in there as the Romans conceived of it. And Archias, this poet that he's defending, Cicero is telling, trying to argue that Archias actually is a Roman citizen, and there's this prosecution to try to exile Archias, and it's actually motivated probably by enmity against Lucullus himself. So Archias wrote this long poem about Lucullus's military exploits in Pontus and Armenia, and he was kind of a client of the Lucullus family. Unfortunately, that, that poem is lost, but Cicero's speech on the poet, again, worth reading. I'll put a link in the show notes if you want to read a translation of Cicero's Pro Archia, in defense of Archias. So Lucullus was a great patron of the arts and letters, and this was part of his legacy that is a little harder to see in the history books, but it was important in his day. Here's Plutarch's final coda on the man, however. And when Cicero was banished from the city and Cato was sent out to Cyprus, Lucullus retired altogether. He's talking about the year 58 BC. Even before his death, it is said that his understanding was affected and gradually faded away. So maybe he had Alzheimer's or dementia or something. But this is really interesting. Cornelius Nepos, however, says that Lucullus lost his mind, not from old age, nor yet from disease. Cornelius Nepos is a Roman biographer, pretty reliable source. So Plutarch's quoting another story from Cornelius Nepos here. Not from old age or from disease that he lost his mind, but that he was disabled by drugs administered to him by one of his freedmen, Callisthenes that the drugs were given to him by Callisthenes in order to win more of his love, more of his favor, his affection, in the belief that they had such a power, but that these drugs drove him from his senses and overwhelmed his reason, so that even while he was still alive, his brother managed his property. Ah, I think that is so fascinating. And You can see, I think, why Plutarch included this funny little story about what it was that kind of ended Lucullus's meaningful life. And that was the very desire that someone had to get more affection from Lucullus was the thing that eventually caused him to, to be driven from his wits, this drug that, you know... This hapless guy, Callisthenes, wanted a kind of like friend potion. Like for all that Lucullus was loved and admired, he struggled to make you feel loved back or admired back if you loved and admired him. I think there are a lot of lessons there for many a hardworking man. But let's send Lucullus off well. Here's the very end of the biography. However, when he died, the people grieved, just as much as if his death had come at the culmination of his military and political services. And they flocked together and tried to compel the young nobles who had carried the body into the forum for his proper Roman funeral to bury it in the Campus Martius, where Sulla also had been buried. But no one had expected this and preparations for it were not easy. And so his brother, by prayers and supplications, succeeded in persuading them to suffer the burial to take place on the estate at Tusculum, where preparations for it had already been made. Nor did he himself long survive Lucullus, but, as in age and reputation he came a little behind him, so did he also in the time of his death, having been a most affectionate brother." So ended Lucullus around 57 BC. If you want to be like Lucullus, focus, cultivate your mind. Don't give in to the injustice of bad men. But I think if you want to learn from his mistakes, here's something you could do. Well, two things. First, 
don't look forward to a time in your life when you'll fully give yourself over to leisure. As long as you have the strength to fight, you should probably be fighting. And that looking forward to luxury can cause us to slacken up because I think we need to love our work to really excel at it. And also, considering the way that Lucullus failed to keep the affection and loyalty of people who should have been devoted to him, well, you could think of someone right now, if you want to learn from his mistakes, think of someone right now who needs your appreciation, someone you owe a lot to, but maybe they don't know it, or they want to know it more from you. Find a way of telling them. That's all for today. If your hands are free and you appreciated this show, why don't you go give us a review on one of the platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or text a friend to tell them how much you love the cost of glory and you love the ancient heroes of the past. Stay strong, stay ancient. This is Alex Petkus. Until next time.